Hello, Smart Money 2 podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kurt Chisholm, and I'll be your host. So today, I'm joined with Anthony Coniglio. How are you doing, Anthony? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Kurt? Good, good. Glad to have you on. So this is, we've had a lot of uh, listeners asking for this topic, so I wanted to bring it on. So Anthony, uh, tell us about yourself, your background, and how you got started in space. Sure, sure. Well, thanks very much for having me. I'm thrilled to be with you today. Uh, so I'm I'm over 30 years in business, started my career as an auditor at Price Waterhouse, was auditing banks, asset managers, um, spent the next 20 years within banking, ultimately becoming an investment banker and focusing on M&A equity and, and all types of capital raising before I left JP Morgan in 2011 to start up a raising mortgage business that um, we developed a new strategy, scaled it up nationally, sold it to a private equity firm. And then we started New Lake in 2019, uh, late 18, early 2019, real estate investment trust focused on the cannabis sector. And it was really late 18 where we really started to pay attention to what was happening around this cannabis sector, high growth business, um, and decided there was an opportunity for us specifically around real estate in the sector. So obviously people have been talking about cannabis since um well i guess whatever it is since uh, 2018 or 19 somewhere around there and people got really excited about it and so i'm curious where where are you seeing opportunities in the space well actually before we get into that why don't you talk about um what it means to invest in cannabis because there's a lot of different things that are that people could do but why don't you talk a little bit around where some of those those different spaces are yeah i think that's an important place to start because a lot of times when people think about cannabis or they see cannabis on CNBC, they'll often see the Canadian companies um, like a Tilray or a Canopy Growth. There are many, many U.S.-based companies that don't actually have access to New York or NASDAQ listings, and so they tend to be less well-known. But the U.S. companies, we think, is where the real action is, if you will, given the size of the U.S. market. So Canada legalized in 2018, and that's what you were talking about when it really came to the fore in the investing community to be focused on this sector. It was very exciting for a period of time, but the U.S. Um, has a patchwork of regulations around cannabis. Um, and so from an investor's perspective, there's dis different ways to play it. You can focus on a company that operates in a single state um, that's typically a private investment, or you could focus on a multi-state operator um, where there are some publicly traded companies on the OTC, or there are a list of ancillary companies, companies that focus or, or around the edges of the business, whether it's a company like ours or Scott's Miracle Grow is an example that provides um, products to the uh, cultivators in the industry, or some of the technology companies that provide tools for retailers and inventory management, just as some examples. There's different ways um, to play it. And this industry has really matured over the last five or six years um, since that Canada legalization created such a spotlight. We've seen an acceleration of state legalizations. We've seen the federal government um, propose to move cannabis from a Schedule One drug to Schedule Three, and that's really allowed, I think, this industry to have more attention and focus. Um, but there are some very uh, restrictive policies in place that limit the amount of uh, investment that people could put in, and I'm guessing that we'll get into some of that. So have they... Did they already move it from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, or is it still proposed? Because I thought that went through. Maybe I missed No, I it's, missed it. it's still proposed. Um, okay. there's, a, there's a lot of statute in place, Administrative Procedures Act, et cetera, that governs it. So the, the Department of Justice made the formal proposal to reschedule, had a comment period that was open until uh, July 22nd. The comment period closed, and about two weeks ago, the DEA announced that there would be a hearing in December um, for anybody that wanted to uh, uh, have their case for opposing the rescheduling in front of administrative law judge. And so we're waiting for that hearing to occur. The DEA will then take that those findings into consideration in coming out with a final rule, uh, either to Schedule 3 or keeping it on Schedule 1 at some time in 2025. Interesting. Yeah, I'm curious why they're going through all the 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 hoops and hurdles to to do it instead of just actually just doing it. But um, I, I, I suppose there's a lot of stuff built around the fact that it's been a Schedule One drug and and now they're going to move it. And there's probably a lot of legal stuff that's baked in there. So there is a lot of legal stuff, and there's even some uh, international treaties that need to be dealt with as part of uh, a UN uh, international uh, con convention that we're part of. Um, 
And so, yeah, there's a lot of complication. My view is they're being very thoughtful, they're being very careful, and they're building up a lot of, um, let's just say they're building up a lot of record to be able to justify the action that's ultimately taken. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. What's um, So let's talk about the the interest in cannabis. I mean, obviously, on an individual level, a lot of people are interested in in uh, recreational, but um, it's. I think initially this was pushed a bunch of years ago because of the medical applications. So, wh what are how are the medical medical applications um, being looked at or utilized now, as opposed to where some of the opportunities uh, could be if it's legalized? Yeah. Well, well, let's start with Pew and Gallup polls. Pew Research and Gallup have been polling around cannabis for over a decade. And consistently, medical cannabis polls around 90% that Americans want legalization of medical cannabis. So we know the people want it. But what we unfortunately don't have is a lot of medical evidence to support that uh, medical use. And the reason is because it's been on Schedule 1. And because it's on Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substances Act, it's very, very difficult to, um, to create research or to have research on cannabis. And so therefore, we are at a, a bit of a loss. And that's part of what's happening with this Schedule 3 process is the opponents are saying, you need to have medical evidence. But how do you get medical evidence if it's still on Schedule 1? So there's still a lot of anecdotal evidence. But by and large, the American people very strongly want um, medical cannabis. And we have 40, I think we're 46 states now that have some form of a medical cannabis program, some of them more restrictive um, than others. And then what we often find is that once you have a medical cannabis program, a lot of those states end up following within the implementation of, a, of an adult use program. Yeah. So um, let me ask you this. So when it comes to, I guess, back in 2018, when this started to become interesting to the public from an investing standpoint, there was a few ways you could invest in cannabis and certainly like Tilray and I forget the other one you mentioned there's like two canopy. or there's canopy yeah, and there was maybe one other small one that was mentioned at the time but there weren't a lot of options right uh you mentioned Scott's Miracle Grow and there's a lot of other people like oh you can invest in this company invest in like the lighting or something but you know it was like five percent of their business so is it really a good investment to invest in a, a company that's supporting all agriculture not just cannabis when it's such a small, small portion of it. So what are your thoughts on how people can invest directly in general areas, not specifically, but just like general areas? Yeah. And so the way we talk about it in the industry is the plant touching and then the non-plant touching business is a plant touching business would be a uh, cultivator, manufacturer, or distributor, uh, retail operator of cannabis. And depending on the state, um, there are different regulations about whether you could be one or all, or in some states like Florida, you have to be all of those and be what's called vertically integrated. And there are different rules state to state. And so even if a company like a green thumb industry, which probably has some of the best financials and uh, profit profile in the industry, they're traded on the OTC, and that's not a recommendation. But if you take green thumb, they operate in over 10 states. And so they have to have different um, they have to replicate their business from state to state. So one way you could play it is the plant touching business. Then another way is the non-plant touching. So there are some companies that are lenders almost exclusively to the sector. Um, and you could find some of those companies. There are companies that provide um, maybe 80% of their business focused on the sector. And there are a couple of garden oriented centers that are focused on uh, providing the cannabis cultivators, soil, nutrients, irrigation equipment, et cetera. Um, and so there are different ways for you to be able to play it. You just need to dig for it. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Not uh, a lot of coverage of the sector, unfortunately. Yeah. No pun intended. Uh, what's, what's, um, what about real estate? I mean, I, I would imagine there's ways to invest in cannabis real estate, right? Yes. And so, you know, take our business, Real Estate Investment Trust, we're the second largest owner of commercial real estate in the U.S. Uh, focused on cannabis. Um, and so, yes, you, we're an adjacent business. Um, we pay a quarterly dividend. And so what we find is people say, I want to have exposure to cannabis, 
Um, and I realize if I invest in a cannabis company, I can make 10x as that company scales and as the, the valuation expands. You're unlikely to get that from, say, a real estate investment, but you will be able to get a regular dividend, which is something you tend to not get out of the actual operators. They're still focusing on building up their cash flow. Um, and so there's just a couple of us that focus on the real estate because of the specialized issues surrounding a focus on cannabis as a sector, uh, a business that's entirely federally illegal. So what about medical use cases? Because, you know, uh, unfortunately, we live in a society where uh, medicine involves drugs and not preventative care or anything like that. So drug companies always want to make more money and they do that by selling more drugs. But if you've got a quote unquote drug that grows out of the ground, it's not really a, a pharmaceutical in their in their in their eyes. But yet they're still looking at that with some application and use cases. So how can people invest in in that from the medical uh, medical side? Yeah, so interesting here in the US, there are a few companies that are public that are actually medical only. I can only think of one or two very, very small companies. Because of uh, most of the companies recognize that the real scale opportunity in the U.S. is focused on the adult use markets. And so you want to be in those large states that have adult use markets. You know, take an Illinois as an example, or in uh, November, Florida has adult use on the ballot um, and could be legalized in 2025. Another very large populous state, um, Ohio, recently legalized adult use, and so many of these operators are focused on adult use states as well as medical. So in the US, it's really difficult to get exposure. You could look for a company in Europe. Um, Germany recently uh, legalized medical cannabis, uh, actually legalized cannabis in general. But over there, it's much more of a pharma oriented approach um, and was really built out of medical. Um, but I'd say pure play medical, it's very, very difficult to find those these days. Yeah, interesting. This is one of the things I struggle with when when it became a hot topic. So people are like, oh, you can invest in cannabis. I'm like, how? You've got a handful of companies. They're not all great. Um, you know, and even now I struggle with it because basically you're investing in agriculture. Right. I mean, that's what it is. You're investing in tobacco. You're investing in corn. You're investing in cannabis or hemp. It's the same thing. So how do you how do you invest in a company that you're going to be the biggest, you know, ag company in the in the cannabis space? It it's you're more likely to have a company that gets built up and then gets acquired by a big, you know, ag company than you are to have a cannabis company grow out of nowhere. And so I, I guess I just kind of wonder, like, how is that seen in the in the space? Like, how is that being perceived? And are the big ag companies going to start growing this in their own? Or how does that work? Yeah, in the states where it's licensed, it's very, it's generally very highly regulated. And so you have to apply for a license in order to be able to cultivate the products, manufacture them, meaning when I say manufacture, it means putting them into the form factor, whether it's into an edible or a tincture um, or a gel or even uh, into a rolled joint or just as flour. Um, what I'd say, though, about the agriculture part, while yes, it's agriculture, what we see by and large in the cannabis industry, particularly in the operators that are public, is most of the cultivation occurs in an indoor environment. And so these facilities tend to look like a GMP certified type of facility with um, temperature control, environmental controls, light control. And they do that in order to modify the THC content. THC is the psychoactive ingredient to the, the THC content, and the higher the content, the more profitable that particular product is. So it tends to be, while it's natural, it's highly controlled and highly engineered in order to try to get the best margin. So it's not that we have fields and acres and acres and acres of outdoor growing. These are sophisticated indoor cultivation facilities to be able to produce the product in a form factor that the consumer wants to consume in. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I'm not a consumer of cannabis, never have been. I don't have anything against it, just just not my not my thing. Um, but I hear there's all these different types and different blends and all this. How does that kind of play in to um to the cannabis space from an investing standpoint? Are are people looking more for variety or is it more like, you know, the tobacco industry, which eventually becomes more unified and you've got one blend and that's it? 
Um, I'm not sure if that's the case. I, I'm just speculating. But yeah, you know, and th this is the exciting thing about cannabis that that I like is looking at what the consumer behavior is today and how does that consumer behavior modify into the future as the industry scales up. And so when we look at most of the product today across the country, most of it is in flour. People want to buy flour and they want to consume flour, whether it be in their own pipe or in in some other apparatus. Now that is because. The primary customer today tends to be, let's say, that very experienced consumer. But if you want to see this industry really scale up, the new consumer isn't going to likely be somebody that wants to buy raw flour. It'll be somebody that's likely to want an edible or a drink. And that's where we see a, a significant amount of growth and really significant amount of opportunity in the industry is these form factors that are more traditional to um, consumption, whether it be matching what I do in a bar with alcohol or uh, just simply taking a gummy uh, as a way to replace alcohol. And we've seen some trends where it's replacing alcohol and we can get into that. But I think it's going to be this switching form factors over time, which allows the industry to scale up and really find that hyper growth. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder if that's the new trend. Um, it, it seems as though drinking is becoming less and less interesting for the younger generation. And uh, from the stats I've seen, there's just fewer and fewer people that are in college or just out of college that are interested in drinking in bars. Um, but right. but certainly a lot of them are, you know, engaging in in other other things. Um, so right. it, it's 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 interesting to me to see that the trends in place. What um as I think of uh, cannabis versus things like hemp. Now, I was listening to a podcast a while ago, and like I said, I'm not an expert in the space, but I, I'm curious because I've heard a lot of things about hemp. Um, how does hemp differ from cannabis? And what are some of the benefits of hemp? Because I've heard, from what I've heard about hemp, it seems like there's a lot of great benefits to it. And it's also not allowed to be grown because of the you know, the schedule one um, uh, that, that things are set up. So can you talk a little bit about the differences and how that works? Yes. Um, so hemp and uh, traditional marijuana or cannabis are the same except for one difference, the THC content. And hemp was legalized in the United States in 2018 under the Farm Bill, and it was defined as cannabis with less than 0.3% THC. Um, and so you grow a hemp plant, and hemp could also be used for industrial reasons. Many people don't know that in early America, hemp was a very large industry for rope and clothing and other industrial applications. Hempcrete is a growing area in the U.S. today, too. It can be used to replicate concrete. Um, but if you take that 0.3% THC and you refine it and you have enough hemp, you can get to higher and higher levels of THC content. And so we've seen many of the hemp operators recognize that they can use what's called the loophole, the hemp loophole in the farm bill, and um, manufacture higher THC content products and not have to sell them through a regulated channel. And so it's amazing, right? They're both the same exact plant, just one produces more THC than the other. And as long as you can keep it under 0.38, 0.3% by dry weight, um, you then uh, are, are running a legal business. And then you could take that dry weight hemp and you could refine it. You could extract those oils, put the oils together and um, put them into a product such as a gummy or a drink. And in fact, there are liquor stores, I'm, in, I'm sitting in Connecticut, there are liquor stores in Connecticut that are carrying hemp THC drinks, which are legal in the US, but it's unregulated product. And that's an issue for the cannabis industry because cannabis industry is very regulated. And so some of the states are trying to get this under control. And in fact, just two days ago, um, Governor Newsom banned these hemp-derived THC products in the state of California um, because of the unregulated, unregulated nature of them. Interesting. I, didn't, I, I would have thought they would have been more pro-freedom uh, around cannabis and THC in California, but interesting. Well, think about it from this perspective. You have a legal cannabis sector that was created by state statute where you have to have a state license and you have to sell state regulated product that has state taxes associated with it. Uh, so there's the key. That. There's the key. <laughs> and you could encourage that, or you could have this unregulated, untaxed product over here that's a theoretical replacement. Um, but I, I really think it has to do with safety. 
when you see a lot of the reports of children going to the hospital, there's lots of articles about incidents of children going to the hospital for cannabis consumption. It's hard to find where they actually purchase that, but the industry believes that a lot of those issues are from purchasing it in the convenience store or in your local smoke shop out of the regulated channel. So they're purchasing unregulated product. You know, most of the states where it's regulated, actually in all the states where it's regulated, you have to show your driver's license and it gets scanned through a database. I mean, it's really very controlled. Um, and there's, it's not like walking into a liquor store with a fake ID. I, it, that really, I'm sure that happens in some corners, but by and large, this industry focuses on selling to above 21, 21 and above. Um, and we know it's safe and tested product. Yeah, I'm sure because no one's used a fake ID to get liquor ever. So <laughs> why would they do that with THC? <laughs> um, interesting. So um, so interesting about hemp because I, I, I'd heard a lot of really interesting things. It's, uh, you know, people can eat it even without the high THC content. Um, one thing it's it's curious because it's related is I know there's a big push for um i'm not sure if i'm describing this accurately but basically the hallucinogenics like psilocybin and other things that people have been using uh to help um people who've been in like a war with ptsd, with certain PTSD mm -hmm. and certain traumatic stuff and there have been shown some efficacy of using that to help them through that uh however it has to be guided and it has to be you know with with a supervised effort but um but it's interesting that there seems to be such a big push for these drugs at the same time you also have a huge amount of fentanyl coming in this country and killing tons of people and uh it seems to be some pretty contradictory messages that are that are happening where do you see directionally things going with other types of drugs or like what what's what are the powers that be kind of showing as the direction of where things are going? Yeah, I think there's a real struggle right now in the quote unquote powers that be. I think there's the I think there's the traditional school of thought that say cannabis is a gateway drug. And we hear some older politicians espouse that. I think by and large, most of the American public doesn't believe that to be true. And there really isn't evidence to that. And in fact, anecdotally, um, again, because we don't have the official research because of the Schedule One designation, but anecdotally, I have heard over the last five years inordinate number of stories of people that were able to replace um, pharmaceuticals with cannabis to treat pain, uh, to be a replacement for opiates, and to really help people wean themselves off of drugs that they just don't want to be on. Now, we need more data so we can show that with definitive, but the anecdotal data absolutely is there. I hear it time and time and again. Um, how people in particular use it to get uh, to get off opiates. Um, the the psilocybin has great promise. Some of those trials show significant efficacy. Um, and one of the reasons they're getting a lot of funding is because of the insurers likely to pay for treatment because if you can have high efficacy to treat PTSD, the insurers are likely and the commercial payers are likely to to pay for those treatments. And so a lot of the funding that's going into that is, of course, because they want to help people with the PTSD, but they see that promise of reimbursement from the commercial payer side. Um, and so that's why you see a lot of funding there. From a cannabis perspective, what we often find is that the medical patient ends up converting into an adult use consumer because they don't want to go through the paying for the medical card, keeping up the medical card. And even though the taxes are typically lower on your medical product, they just don't keep up with it. Um, and we just, again, we don't have enough research out there to be able to dose properly. So they end up moving into the adult use market. So I think it all has promise, but I think it all needs a lot more research so we can have a more of a definitive discussion about the efficacy of, of all of these products. But my last point is back to your question around the powers that be. I think the powers that be want more data. Um, and I think we need to make some changes to policy so we can get more data and get more, excuse me, get more research to get more data so we could definitively resolve this. You're right. And as you said earlier, you can't get the data because you can't do research and schedule one drugs. Correct. So it's a catch 20. Very, very people. limited. There's only a very yeah. limited number of uh, organizations that can do research on cannabis right now. Okay. So let me ask you this because I had, um, when this became a big thing, uh, I had a bunch of prospective clients contact us because they wanted to put cannabis or cannabis related investments inside the retirement account. And of course, this is something you can do, 
with the exception of the fact of the custodians don't allow it. So right. we actually had somebody who came to us and said, hey, I want to buy cannabis related investment. We were within a week of doing it. And then I think it was it was the OCC who passed a rule that said the banks are not allowed to custody anything related to uh, cannabis. So a week later, and the client would have been in trouble, like you don't know what's going to pass. They don't tell you and they just did it. Uh, so we we're fortunate it didn't happen. You know, we were we didn't get stuck in that because then it would have, you know, had all sorts of problems, distributions. But point being is when you when you have stuff like that, um, it, the issue, from my understanding, has always been in the cannabis industry is banking. It's not it's not the business because some states allow it. They don't allow it. They have licenses. There's oversight. But the banking system's always been like the federal government's like mallet that they hit you with uh, to to disrupt any sort of uh, use of, of of cannabis. So, can you kind of talk a little bit about that and how that works? Yeah, let's start with custody, and then we'll talk about banking. Um, unfortunately, we at New Lake we lived through this because we IPO'd in the summer of 2021, and it was the fall. It was around November of 2021 when a lot of these uh, policies changed at the custodians. And this really, what it, nobody knows for sure exactly where it started, um, but what we understand is that from an investigation, a Credit Suisse back in early 2021, I believe it was from the Green Sill. Uh, debacle that occurred there. It was a review, an external review of their internal policies. And through that review, they found that they were custodying um, cannabis and cannabis related stocks. Uh, and so a new policy directive went out. It's not clear exactly wh who put it out. But during the fall of 2021, a lot of those custody agents, the large ones, all pulled back from what are called MRBs, marijuana-related businesses. Um, and so in a world where we IPO'd, where we had institutional demand and our stock price was growing, given the demand in the marketplace, to four or five months later, where the institutional demand was chilled. Um, and then during the course of 2022, you had some unwinding of those positions because institutions don't like to sit on positions they can't either grow or, or become theoretically illiquid. Um, you started to see a real chilling effect in the cannabis industry during the course of 22 and 23 in terms of new capital because of this custody issue. And like, if somebody would go to our website and look at our investor page, we have a drop down of where you could custody our stock. What public company has to have that kind of a drop down? Um, it's really difficult. And I meet with institutional investors all the time who say, I get your story. I love it but I can't custody your stock, so I can't start building a position. And it has a it has a, a cycle effect because it reduces liquidity, which makes the, the sector less attractive. And so we really need reform. And now I'm gonna to transition to banking in a moment, but we really need reform so that we can get the custody banks to open up custody to improve liquidity so we can get in institutional demand going again for the sector. One way to get that would be through the safe banking bill. Um, and so this is a bill that's passed Congress four or five times over the last five years, has never gotten to the floor in the Senate, has passed out of the Senate Banking Committee. Um, but it's actually a misnomer that banks don't service the industry. In fact, FinCEN puts out a list on a quarterly basis, and consistently there's over 500 banks in this country that file uh, special suspicious activity reports, SARS. These are suspicious activity reports designed specifically for the cannabis industry. So we know there's over 500 banks that service this industry. We know there's thousands and thousands of banks in the U.S. So it's not the large money center banks. It's not the large regionals. So you don't have, I'd say you don't have 90% of the banking system or 80 to 90% of the banking system available to the industry. So that's a real issue. But we won't do business with anybody that doesn't hasn't been able to figure this one out. But if we can get safe banking passed and we can get more regular way banks to be able to provide services to the industry, it'll allow employees of these companies to gain access to mortgages. Because right now you can't use cannabis company income to qualify for a Fannie or Freddie mortgage. It's non-qualifying income. Something like that stifles the economy. So if we can get that passed, we can get those employees getting banking services. The companies themselves can lower their compliance costs because these bank accounts they do have access to are very expensive. And then within the safe banking, provisions can be implemented to allow the exchanges like a New York or a NASDAQ to list these companies, providing a more liquid platform for companies in the industry to raise capital and bring in that institutional demand that's really wanting to be involved in the industry. But today, 
just can't because they can't get their custody agent to take the stock or the bond. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I didn't realize that that the uh, cannabis income couldn't qualify for mortgage. That's even more devious than I had previously thought, because I know other things. I, I know a lot of the companies were cash based, which, of course, creates more problems because there's more crime and people trying to rob the cash based business, um, which, of course, forces it to be more require protective measures in the in the uh yes. you know in the behind the scenes <laughs> it's the whole industry of that um but yeah it, it's it's interesting to me that that they went down that rabbit hole uh and that I, I know with the the custody issue is a big problem uh but I thought it was the OCC or, or maybe it was someone else who who said you couldn't do it with for the banks a, a few years ago so um Hopefully the federal federal government will get their their act together um, because to me it just seems uh, kind of ridiculous that we're having these conversations. Yeah. Um, I when, agree with you. I agree with you. You know, it's similar in the in the sense that like you know the crypto space. You know, they they, they said they're going to pass stuff and then they made it worse. And it's like, what are you doing? Like, wait, it, it, it to me. Well, anyway, that's you know, there's four hundred and twenty. There's over four hundred and twenty thousand people employed in the cannabis industry in the U.S. For a period of time, it was one of the fastest growing uh, employment segments in our economy, but it's not recognized by um, by the federal government in the employment numbers. It's not recognized in GDP. Um, it's, a, it's a meaningful industry. It rivals the beer industry. It rivals the spirits industry in terms of revenue and employment. Uh, and, and it would be great to see this industry normalized, especially since there are, listen, in this political environment, there are very few things the American people believe to the tune of 70%. And that's where adult use cannabis polls across the US. 70% of Americans agree. 90% for medical, 70% for adult use. What do we agree on as a country to that extent? And I think that's why Donald Trump earlier this week came out in support of it. Yeah. So talk about that, because I know, obviously, we've got an election coming up, and I'm not sure if this will be out before or after the election. But uh, but we have an election coming up, uh, Trump versus Harris. And so what are both sides? What What is their position on on cannabis and, I guess, related uh, regulations in the space? Yeah. So as we sit here today, the Harris uh, camp has not come out with their official position on cannabis. But within the Biden administration, um, the Biden administration initiated the rescheduling from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, initiated a pardoning process to pardon federal prisoners who are in for cannabis-only possessions. Now, it's not a lot of people. You generally don't go to federal prison for cannabis possession. Usually, it would be at a state level. But the symbolism was there. For her part, Vice President Harris hosted a roundtable earlier this year in the White House talking about cannabis reform and calling for decriminalization of cannabis across the U.S. And so we expect once her platform comes out fully uh, around cannabis policy, that it'll have something to do with decriminalization and the support of either full descheduling or at least a rescheduling to Schedule 3. For candidate Trump's part, earlier this week, he announced through Truth Social that he was voting yes on Amendment 3 in Florida. Now, this is really interesting because the first time that I'm aware of in the history of our elections, we have a presidential candidate that resides in a state that has adult use cannabis on the ballot. So he has the opportunity to vote yes or no on should Florida legalize adult use cannabis. And he announced that he's voting yes on what's called Amendment 3. So he's supporting adult use cannabis in Florida. He also said that he supported Schedule 3 um, so he wants a rescheduling from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. He went further to say as president, he'd seek common sense reform, Him, his words, common sense reform, specifically around this Safe Banking Act. We were just talking about banking reform, so this bill that passed the House. So he expressed support for safe banking to get passed, and he also expressed support for a Nancy Mace proposal called the States Act, which is decriminalizing at the federal level and allowing states to make the decision if they want to legalize cannabis or not. That's groundbreaking, quite frankly, in terms of um, support at the federal level for cannabis reform. Now, we'll see if it comes to fruition and how long it actually takes to get there, but to have a presidential candidate talking about this policy is, is groundbreaking for this industry and really bodes well for the future uh, reform efforts, which then leads to future growth and leads to expansion of opportunities for your audience to invest in the sector. 
Yeah, it's great. It's uh, it's great that they're talking about it. I, I I always feel like nothing ever gets done until presidential election season, and then all of a sudden, everyone's got all these proposals. Trump was uh, president for four years and never passed it, even though I thought he probably should have. Uh, you know, pushed it a little bit, and even Biden and Harris, who been four years, and they're they didn't, you know, I mean, they should have. So it to me, it's always puzzling, and it's always politics. It's never yes. about what people want. It's always politically expedient. But um, but I agree with you. I think if seventy percent of the people want it, then it's kind of hard to say no. You know, right? But um, cool. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here in the interest of time. But any any kind of final thoughts and things you think uh, the listeners should know about the cannabis space and and how they can invest or even some of the risks involved? Yeah, I would say if you look um, if you look at the U.S. operators, most of them are OTC or CSE listed. Um, some of them are getting on the Toronto Stock Exchange, which does open up some custody opportunities. Um, I, I think. I would just tell people to be careful. The liquidity in these stocks is um, is limited. So really look at the daily average trading volume, understand that relative to your personal liquidity needs for some of these stocks. Um, but if you have the patience and you can, you can sit in and stomach the illiquidity and volatility, these stocks don't move in pennies. The bid ask is pretty wide. If you could stomach it, there's real opportunity here because you'd be in the sector before the institutional investor really has access to it because of that custody issue we talked about. So it's very rare that a public market retail investor can get in front of institutions on an investment. And so, of course, do your homework, understand the debt load. Some of these companies have a lot of debt on them. Uh, some of these companies are generating free cash flow, some are not. So, of course, do your homework, understand the, the financial profile of these businesses. But if you have the opportunity to stomach the volatility and the illiquidity for a period of time, you can absolutely be in front of uh, institutions in this sector because there are structural impediments. Absolutely. So, all right, so we're going to wrap it up here, Anthony. I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, where can people find more about you? Sure, thanks. Um, we are newlake.com, newlake.com, um, publicly traded company, traded on the OTC. We qualify for all listing on New York and NASDAQ, but because of these federal restrictions we've talked about, we're we're stuck on the OTC. But once federal reform happens, you know, we'd be excited for and could move quickly to uplist to one of the major exchanges. Um, but newlake.com investors is where you can find us. Awesome. Well, thanks again for joining us, Anthony. Appreciate you coming to the show and sharing your wisdom with us. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll have you back on in the future. I'm sure there's a lot of, lot of progress can be made in this space over the next few years. Kirk, thanks so much for having me. Enjoyed the discussion. Hey, Doug, did you hear? We're giving away free money. Well, I'll tell you about it in a minute. But before I do, there's a saying in the mining community, well, precious metals mining, that is. The saying is that if you want the best deals, you have to be in the room. Now, you're probably thinking, what does it mean to be in the room? Well, I'll tell you. Being in the room means that you're on the short list of people who get invited to be a part of the best deals. These are the deals that most investors will never have access to. You mean like IPOs? Nope, IPOs are chump change. Those are for retail investors, small potatoes. That's nothing compared to these deals. These deals would have you salivating to get access to them. Once you know they exist, you will never look at investing the same way again. I almost don't want to even tell you that they exist because it will ruin your thinking of how the investing world really works. Now, you might be excited that these deals exist, but you only have access to the deals if you're an insider or in the room, as they call it. Now, as loyal listeners to the show, I'm going to give you a chance to be in the room. Money Tree Investing Podcast has created the Insiders Club. This is a community of our show's members who are loyal listeners of the show and want to get more out of their investing experience. Being a part of the Insiders Club gives you insider status for upcoming events and webinars, discounts, free stuff and books, and influence on the future direction of the show. This is a great opportunity to join us as we expand our content and services. Oh, and did I mention free money? Yes, in the next few weeks, I'll be giving away free money to our members of the Insiders Club as my appreciation for listening to the show. Now, there's no cost to join the Insiders Club. Just go to moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money today to join the community. 
That's www.moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money. I hope to see you in the room. All right, that was a great interview with Anthony. Really appreciate him coming on the show. Now we're into the panel portion of our show. We have our very own Barb Freeberg. Hey, Barb. Hi, Kirk. How are you doing today? Doing great. Doing great. We have an abbreviated panel today. It is everyone's back to school and we uh, people are off, off traveling. So it's just me and Barb today. So Barb, what were some of your thoughts of the interview? You know, I've had an interest in the cannabis field for a while just because on the surface, it looks like it presents a really interesting opportunity. It's kind of a new uh, a new field that one might be able to invest in. And frequently with new fields comes profitability options. And actually about three years ago, I wrote an article for US News and World Report about cannabis ETFs you can invest in. But the problem is, as Anthony, Anthony relayed, it's not that easy to invest in the cannabis industry. A lot of regulations. And so it raises the question that I think we'll discuss today is, you know, how do you tackle a, an industry like that that looks like it has potential, but is a little tricky to invest in? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny, uh, when this trend started, I was getting bombarded by calls from clients saying, Hey, can we invest? How do we invest in cannabis? How do we do this? How do we do this? And it's like, and it's funny because I get these calls, it, it, they're, getting the calls is good because what it tells me is that the first leg of the trend is over. So what typically happens is when a trend starts, the people who are in the weeds, like, people in the cannabis space who actually know what's going on. Like they're in there first, right? It's, it's like the most recent one is like uh, crypto. So the crypto people got involved in like the mid 2010s is, is when the kind of the, the geeks and the hobbyists got involved where it was still just kind of like a cool thing, uh, but no one really knew about it. 2017 is when I found out about it. Uh, we started investing in it and it was still not really well known, but it peaked. So you got some interest in the public. And then as soon as everyone was in, then it crashed. And then it comes up again and crashes. So you always know when you get calls, like, all right, it's probably close to the peak because if the common common person is asking, it means that it's 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 in the it's in the mainstream discussions. And it probably means the trend is close to over. And so what happened with cannabis is I started getting calls because I knew it was kind of hot. Um, but there was only three companies really you could invest in realistically. Um, and I didn't really love either any of them, but I, I knew they were getting a lot of play and a lot of airtime. And so I got calls. Hey, how can we invest in this? As soon as I got like my first five calls, that's when it peaked. And then it just went down, down, down for a period of time. And it was totally out of favor up until recently where people are starting to get interested in it again. But it is a typical cycle that new trends follow is it gets the hot era so you think of like the internet stocks everything was hot and then everything got decimated in the early 2000s and it took in some cases like microsoft took i think 14 years to start trending up again and they were bottomed out and that's a good company right it's it's you know uh, it's it's a great company today it was a good company then it was just really expensive which is why it was bottomed out a lot of other companies were in the same boat, right? Big tech, they were they were bottomed out. And uh, it didn't, when things started to come back, but it took a long time for people to come back from the trend. So it's important to know because AI right now is having the same thing where everyone wants to invest in AI. And it's probably the worst time to invest because it's already overpriced, way overpriced. Um, CEOs are coming out and saying that they're not getting any ROI in it. So they're not putting money into it. Doesn't mean it's not a good trend just to be clear. But the point is, is everything goes through these cycles. It's very common. It always happens. It doesn't mean that the trend stops. As we know, with cannabis, obviously, the trend is going forward. Uh, it just means that the um, the opportunities change, right, from when the initial opportunity is where people are trying to get ahead of it, to when the actual opportunities come about. 
So Barb, talk about some of your experiences with things like cannabis who've been through trends like that. I love that you mentioned Microsoft because it just reminded me that I did actually invest in Microsoft in the idea of following that trend at some point in the last millennia. I don't remember exactly what my result was, but all I can say now is I don't own it. And I think if it had been a big win for me, I would have remembered that. Additionally, I don't know if those of you out there remember this from, again, the last millennia, so I am dating myself a little bit, but Nokia used to be like the biggest, biggest cell phone operator. And I am at heart a value investor, and that's pretty much how I've been my entire career. And so I saw Nokia go up, 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 up. And I had, I had it on my radar because I thought Nokia is a great company. Well, then it ran into some troubles and it dropped back really far. And I said, oh, great. This is an entry point for me. I jumped into Nokia. And long story short, it never recovered. And I finally exited my position at some point uh, with, you know, a loss, which happens if you've been investing for a while, you're going to get some losses, which the point is picking a stock based on trend analysis can be amazing. I have stocks in my portfolio right now, and in general, I invest in index funds, but I do keep about 5% of our investments in more speculative individual stocks, sectors, that sort of things. For example, I have um, Lowe's, which I've invested in, oh my gosh, I can't even remember how long. And it's at least a five plus, uh, re you know, it's, it's increased over 500% because at the time I invested in it was a time that people were starting to do a lot of home repairs. And I saw that trend and I wanted to play that trend. And so I bought Lowe's and Lowe's I still own today after decades and it's done very well for me. But picking the trends at the right time, buying in at the right time before, as you said, Kirk, they become too popular and then you end up buying them at a period where they're either peaking or there's been a pullback for a reason, and it's a really good reason, and it doesn't recover, like my experience with Nokia. So thoughts, Kirk, I mean, what do you think of the trend buying idea when you are picking stocks and or sectors? So I use an interesting mix of things. Um, I'm not a trend follower. I mean, trend following is is a, you know, it's an art. It's very much like uh, if you think about the different kinds of investing, I mean, there's fundamental analysis, which is basically just looking at numbers and picking stocks, which is a tried and true method. Excuse for... me. Fundamental analysis is not looking at numbers and picking stocks. You're forgetting the main premise. You look at the numbers, you evaluate them, you look at the ratios, you compare them with this their historical performance, and you search for those that are either fairly or undervalued. So, so I cannot let you stop at that, Kirk. Apparently, I triggered Barb. There was a debate, presidential debate last night, and Barb's triggered by my definition of fundamental analysis. <laughs> yes, but please don't tell me which candidate you think I am like, okay? I do not want to play that game. I, I told you I'm voting for Superman, so I don't know which, which candidate you're voting for, but <laughs> Superman's the clear winner. Um, I do love Superman. Yeah. <laughs> Good. We're on the same page. Anyway, I was trying to abbreviate my definition here, but um, so fundamental analysis is a school of thinking around investing and technical analysis is a school of thinking around investing. Uh, trend following is kind of fits in the the trend. It fits in the um, in the technical analysis field, and then there's some others. There's quantitative, but ultimately, what it comes down to is, I've come to the conclusion that there is no single best. Um, and you could say, well, Warren Buffett's really successful, and he uses fundamental. It's say great, but 
there are times where fundamental outperforms and there are times where technicals outperform. And pretty much the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, fundamental fundamental analysis has not done very well in large and value stocks have not done very well. It doesn't mean that they're not important. It just means that they're not in favor with that style. So, um, you know, I mean, you could just follow the biggest seven tech stocks and do great. You don't need to do fundamental analysis to do that. I'm not saying it's a good idea, just saying that's what's worked. And so, you know, what I've learned over the years is you have to be, you have to be agile and flexible with your, um, your way of investing, because when things are in favor, you have to be able to adapt to that. When they're out of favor, you have to be able to adapt to that. You can't just stick your, you know, stick your, put your feet down and say, I'm going to do it this way. And everyone's going to move around me. No one cares about you. People only care about the price. The price is all that matters. Your opinion doesn't matter. The stock market doesn't care about your opinion. So if you think, you know, NVIDIA is going to go to the moon or, you know, some value stocks can go to the moon, that's great on you. But the market doesn't care about you. And so we all have to take the, uh, we all have to have the mindfulness enough to know that our opinions don't matter in the context of the stock market. We cannot make the stock market move and bend to our wishes. And we have to realize that, you know, uh, as, as um, uh, Bruce, was it Bruce Lee who said, you know, be, wa be like water, right? You have to be like water, like, you know, you're, you're not the rock, right? The, st the stock prices are the rock, you're the water. So understanding trend following is an important skill. Um, there are times where it does well and there are times it doesn't. So I'm not a, um, a dyed in the wool trend follower. I just know how to utilize that skill to my benefit. And so, you know, if you use something as simple as like a 200 day moving average, that's a great simple tool you can use without having to be really, really smart at technical analysis. You don't have to know, you know, um, all these technical indicators that people follow. And, you know, in some cases that stuff's like uh, reading the tea leaves, but enough people follow it and believe it, it then it starts to work. So even though you're, you know, it's, it's like the, um, you create the future by believing in a future. It's like the future creates itself around the fact that enough people believe it, right? Um, it's their call popper came out with the term reflexivity, which is something like inflation is caused when enough people believe there's inflation. Deflation is caused when enough people believe in deflation, because if you think there's inflation, what are you going to do? You're going to take out a lot of debt and you're going to, you're going to borrow in your house and you're going to and you're going to borrow money and you're going to invest it. If you think there's deflation, you're going to pay off all your debt and you're going to sit in cash. So each one of those reactions that I have cause more of that thing. And if enough people do it, it causes more of that thing. So technically you kind of create the future if enough people do it. Same thing happens with technical analysis. So there is merit to it because enough people follow it. Um anyway, getting back to your point, I do like following trends. I do like trend following because i think you can learn a lot from it and then we and i just uh outlined one of the parts of trend following is if you follow a new trend it typically goes through a new adoption phase uh or or the excitement phase i there, there's actually i don't have the the phases labeled in front of me but basically this initial excitement phase where everybody's on board it's not really being used but everyone's really happy about it and then people realize Oh crap! This isn't being used. No one's touching it. I'm just going to sell it. It's it's uh, it's too early. And then they sell, and it bottoms out. And then it actually starts to get adopted. Um, and cannabis is a good example of this, right? Is you know, a, a state or two made it legal, and oh, it's going to be great. And and then no other, you know, a handful of other states was really slow adopting, a lot slower than people thought. So then it bottomed out. And now that they're they're both uh, presidential candidates are talking about legalizing on a federal level, which I think is well past due. Um, I don't know why this wasn't done on either administration when they were in before, but it wasn't. And now everyone kind of agrees, hey, this should be legal at the federal level and let the states decide, uh, which I think is probably a good good way to handle it. Um, and that way, it, it people can decide on the state level of what they want, because it does need oversight. Um, anyway, so that's a good trend. It's starting to pick up again, but now we need to figure out how to invest in it, which is another problem. So how should people be thinking about this bar? Because I know there's a, a there's a cannabis ETF out there, uh, at least one, maybe two 
the tree. But it's kind of like investing in the Cuba ETF. I don't even know if that still exists, but there was one on Cuba. Well, Cuba is a communist country. They don't have any public health companies. And and every company in there, like 70% of them were uh, basically Spanish companies, <laughs> oddly enough, um, even though it had nothing to do with Cuba. So, uh, you know, how sh should people be looking at ETFs? Should be looking at individual stocks? Like, how should people be considering this sector? Great question, Kirk. And my underlying philosophy of investing, and you may agree with it, you may not agree with it, but all I can say is it has a lot of research behind it, and many people are on my team in thinking that index fund investing, diversified portfolio, over the long term, research has shown, beats stock picking. Now, one year you might get a stock picker who does amazing, but the possibility that he or she is going to outperform year over year is very, very unlikely. That said, even us diehard indexers, many of us like the idea of picking and choosing a stock now and then. So my underlying theory is take 5% of your investment portfolio or, you know, a little more if you'd like and try out different trends, that sort of thing. Pick stocks, see how it works. Sometimes you're going to have a great, a great stock or a great sector and it's going to outperform. I've got two stocks in my portfolio in that 5% of my speculative investing portion that have gone doubled, tripled, quadrupled five times for lows. And the other one is a healthcare stock. It has done very, very well. I have a third healthcare stock that I purchased during COVID because they were on the forefront of creating a vaccine. They did create an, a vaccine and they did amazing until they didn't. And now they're back down, but they're paying a 6% dividend. So kind of a win-win for me. So that's my theory. And I do also want to jump back on something you said, Kirk, because you talked about momentum investing and technical analysis, which I know many people are interested in, a lot of people. And that also does have some research behind it. But the problem with momentum investing and technical analysis, first of all, the idea is you jump on a trend, when a stock or a sector is going up, more it's going to continue going up for a while because more and more people are going to buy into it, as Kirk, you uh, suggested. But the problem is when that stops and you're still in it, you have the ride going down and you don't know really when you're at the top of a trend. So that's a disadvantage of that type of investing or else you have to like stay on it a lot so you can figure out when to get out. And so I think there's a, a place for many, many different types of investing, whatever works for you. Um, and I do get that you want to try and pick your hand at stocks or sectors. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but just to understand that that's going to be a riskier path than the following just the market with index funds. I mean, research has proven that time over time again. Yeah, no, it's a, it's it's good to get that perspective. I appreciate that, Barb. And, and you know, I think this kind of brings back uh, a conversation we had about two years ago when we talked about investing in space. Um, we had a, a guest on that, that was really, um, as we say in Boston, wicked smart. Um, and that was kind of her field. She worked for NASA. She's very, very smart. And I highly recommend uh, listening to that. But the point is that we have, um, we had a, 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 a uh, I was going to say a space of space uh, where, you know, it's a great idea. I mean, you think like Elon Musk is going out there and a lot, you know, you, you've got all, uh, Origin, Origin Blue, or I forget all the names, but anyway, SpaceX and plus a few others. And and it's a great idea. We should be doing that. We should be commercializing space. We should be trying to get into space. There's a lot of applications and, and good things to do that. And frankly, if we stay here long enough, we're going to blow ourselves up. So it's probably a good idea to try to get into space. Um, so, you know, I look at that and say, that's a great trend. How do you invest in it? 
you can't like <laughs> there's no good way and people say well you can invest in this and this it's like yeah okay you can invest in like uh boeing raytheon lockheed uh aerospace companies great there's some application there but also how much of that revenue or profit is generated from space well if it's only five percent you're not really investing in a space company you're investing in a defense company or uh depend you know aerospace depending on what they're doing um so the point being is there's there's rarely a um a company out there that's really focused on a single thing like he mentioned scott's miracle grow on the interview which is a great idea but they also service other agriculture and that can potentially be a really bad idea because it could be that cannabis is going through the roof right let's say we're having an ai moment and cannabis goes through the roof let's say they legalize in all the states and all of a sudden everyone's going to start growing pot in their backyard well you're going to need scott's miracle grow right well that's that's potentially a good idea um the the problem is is if if they have for example um let's say 50 percent of their revenue is from cannabis and let's say 50 percent is from regular agriculture and let's say cannabis is doing well but the ag sector just gets blown apart let's say everyone stops planting crops just for the sake of example well, now you're balancing it out. And now it's like, well, great performance from cannabis, but terrible from ag. So now you get this lackluster performance overall from the stock. So the problem with investing in stocks that have a little bit of exposure in this and a lot in something else is that something else will typically drive revenues. And so when companies try to put together an ETF, they're frequently looking for related areas. And to give you an example, like I, I haven't done this for a while because it's the, the ETF world has gotten so polluted. Um, but there was a time where ExxonMobil was a both growth stock and a value stock. It was a clean energy stock and a dirty energy stock. It was a dividend stock and it was a non-dividend stock. Like it was in everything because it was a very liquid stock. And frequently ETF creators have to do this. They need liquid stocks. So if you can't find liquid stocks, you 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 have illiquid stocks and that presents a problem because you're trying to, you're basically moving the market because you've got such a big block of shares trading. Uh, so they're, they'd much rather dilute the quality of, or not the quality, but dilute the goal of what you're going for to go for liquidity because they have to. It's just an essential part of what they do. So these are important aspects that need to be considered when you're in these um kind of alternative areas that aren't quite established yet. Um, so finding a space ETF, well, if there's nothing to invest in, what's the point? You're just investing in, you know, basically airplanes and defense companies, which you could do that. You can find other ETFs for that. Anyway, so I, I just want to kind of point that out to 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 be the the uh the the thorn and barb side with the ETFs. Uh, it does take both sides and just you know, ETFs aren't bad. You just got to know what you're investing in. So don't go in blind. Just say, oh, cannabis ETF. Let me just put all my money there. Know what it's investing in. Because if you don't, you could be invested in something completely different than what you expect. So um, I, I do want to ask, Barb, uh, because, you know, in, in talking with Anthony, obviously, a big part of this investing is in the private sector, right? There's not a lot of opportunities in the public sector. Uh, so investing in the private sector might be a better way to do it. And I have clients who've come to me who've said, hey, I want to put this cannabis-related investment in my IRA. And, and a quick side story to elaborate on what we were talking about on the interview is, you know, I had a client come to me and said, I want to invest in this cannabis-related company. It wasn't direct, it was related. Um, and I want to put that in my IRA. And we, we were like a week away from closing on the deal and and then the uh, I think it was the OCC came out and said and they nixed it. They said you as a custodian you cannot take cannabis related assets. And if anything, you have to you have to uh, uh, you have to kind of uh, get rid of them off of your whatever you're doing now. So anybody who's already doing it was in trouble, and it, it, nothing was grandfathered. They're like, nope, got to get it out of here. And so a lot of people got into trouble for that. And we were fortunate that it that it happened a week before closing, or else the client would have been in trouble and there's nothing you could have done because there wasn't any 
any sort of foresight of, oh, we're going to do this. They just did it. They just said, we're just doing this. And uh, anyway, point being is uh, there's a lot of risks involved in the alternative space that aren't necessarily involved in the traditional space. Um, however, the opportunities can be greater. So, Barb, how would you kind of look at this? you know, just from a general due diligence standpoint of how people should be thinking about this on the traditional versus the, maybe the the non-public side? That is a great question, because I don't know if you've experienced this, Kirk, but it seems as though the private investment sector continues. And actually, I know there's uh, a lot of a lot written about this that the private sector continues to grow and grow and grow. And many companies choose to stay private. First of all, there's one barrier, which is most decent private opportunities, you have to be an accredited investor. So you need either a certain amount of money, a certain amount of uh, income, net worth, or expertise in order to access these investments. Now, there are some crowdfunding apps that allow smaller non-accredited investors to get into the private and alternative universe. And I, I can't really address the specific returns or not because I, I just don't know. And I think it's going to depend on what portions of investments you have selected. But Kirk is completely right. And I don't say this lightly. But or often enough, <laughs> or often enough, of course. I so much like to pick a fight with Kirk that I actually have to bite my tongue when I give him a compliment. But <laughs> that said, the growth potential is stupendous. You know, we all know of these stories you get in on the ground floor, these big, popular billion dollar companies, and you make a ton of money. But those opportunities are few and far between. And so you have to be prepared for the majority of them, private or alternative investments, not delivering a great return. Be aware that over the past hundred years, and we know the past does not predict the future and there's no guarantees about the returns of the future, but over the past hundred plus years, the US stock market has delivered a nine-ish percent annual return. I don't know about you, but I can live with that. Let's say it even drops to seven or six because it has been lower during certain periods, the average return. But if you're a long-term investor, there's a certain comfort in investing in you, a, a group of US and international public companies that are traded on public exchanges that are liquid. You can get your money in and out whenever you want, and that have a pretty decent track record. That said, if you are not satisfied with that return and you want to shoot for the moon and you're a huge risk taker, by all means, invest in the private sector. But keep in mind, it's on you to do your due diligence. And I have seen founders and people that are starting these private investments. I read their LinkedIn profiles. I looked at their documents and I think to myself, where does this person get off thinking they can take my money? They have less experience and knowledge than I do. Why would I invest in them? So a lot of due diligence, a lot of different fields. I looked at one time, uh, two different private investments that came to me. One was about investing in legal trials where there's a potential for a big payoff. They need money up front because typically these big uh, legal trial, many of these legal trials do it on the hope and expectation that they're going to garner a big win. If they don't get that win, they've got a lot of costs. Another one was um, med tech, a lot of upside potential. So long story short, my advice on this and my experience on this is go in with your eyes up, be prepared. You're going to have to tie your capital, capital up in most cases, five, 10 or longer years. The payoff likelihood can be 
questionable. The potential is greater, but also is the potential for a lackluster performance. Personally, I have just made a decision to simplify my investments. I don't invest in private opportunities. I don't think that's right for everyone. It's just right for me. Yeah, no, I think it's a good perspective. I, I think, you know, one of the challenges of being an investor is um, knowing your own limits and knowing your own strengths and weaknesses. And I think it gets really easy to get uh, swept up in a trend and the energy of the trend and wow, everyone else is doing, everyone's talking about it. I want a position so I can talk about it at the next cocktail party. Like a lot of people feel that like it's a social part of it. It's like, oh, they want to be able to talk about their investments. I mean, investments should be boring. You should never be talking about your investments. You should never get excited about your investments. Um, if you're getting excited about your investments, you should really second guess what you're doing uh, because it's like going to the casino. You get excited to go to the casino because you're going to win lots of money. You don't go in there like sad, like, oh, I right, gotta go to the casino again, right? Like you're going in there, you, you want to win. Um, and most people think the same thing about the stock market. The problem is, is when you're investing in a company, you shouldn't be excited about the company. You might get excited about the price that I could say like, hey, I, I've been eyeing this company and it dropped 50% and it's a bargain that I can get excited about. But I could care less about the company. Like the company is what it is. It's either going to do a good job or a bad job. And if I've done my research properly, then it should do what it has to do. You know, the good part about public companies, you can get in and out. Hey, I, I made a bet. And tomorrow the, the, the market blows up because Powell came out with his pants down and everyone was like, what's going on? Is he losing his mind? I, you know, anything could happen. On the private side, you can't get out. Like you're done, like you're in. <laughs> and sometimes there's no exit strategy. You're in for 20 years. There's nothing you can do. Um, so you need to be really careful on the private side is what is the exit strategy? With the public side, you probably shouldn't be day trading stocks anyway, but at least you can if you make a mistake. Now I bought companies and then the next day, you know, some news comes out and like, oh, made a mistake, I'm out. You know, like, I, you know, you don't always know. Sometimes these things happen. Sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes you buy and you're like, good news comes out and it pops and you're just like, oh, that was good timing. It was just luck. But um, on the private side, it's more of a long-term commitment because you're in and you, you're you in until they either sell or IPO or someone can buy your shares from you. And, and sometimes that can be really hard. So um, point being is when you're investing, uh, make sure you understand the trade-offs because there are trade-offs. If you're investing in private companies, you can get a better deal. You can get a cheaper stock, you know, a lower PE ratio, if you will. The downside is you can't necessarily sell it. So you're giving up a uh, price for liquidity. And sometimes that's a good thing, depending on the company. But you just need to be aware of that and don't get all excited. Hey, I got a chance to invest in this new uh, garage startup tech company that uh, that some 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 18 year old kids down the street are starting up and it's gonna be the next Apple. Like, okay, maybe, I mean, <laughs> give them 20 bucks, <laughs> keep the lights on. But generally speaking, you want to be very careful about where you put your private money because uh, you could get stuck and the chance of success for private companies are actually a lot lower than they are for public companies. Even though public companies fail uh, with relative frequency, um, the private side is certainly much greater. So you just have to be careful. So as we kind of wrap it up here, uh, Barb, uh, final thoughts from you as as we're we're looking to take our final puff uh, on this uh, on this topic. <laughs> I like that, and I also like that you have never smoked marijuana. Is that never? Never. Wow. Me and Bill Clinton never. Although <laughs> I, I've done it one fewer times than Bill Clinton. He, he's done it. He he didn't inhale. I didn't okay. inhale or exhale, so I'm I'm okay. good. Okay. But no, I, I never touch the stuff. I have nothing against it, by the way. I I, 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 I gotcha. I gotcha. So so Not you are me. literally a unicorn. I am a unicorn. No drugs. You are. 
Right. No drugs, no smoking. I have drank before. <laughs> I will tell you, I have okay. imbibed, but uh, but okay. I've never done drugs or okay. cigarettes or gotcha. coffee. So I had to get that on the record. Yes, and it's on the record. We're it's not on the internet. It's true. <laughs> we are not going down that path because let me just say, I was a young woman in the nineteen uh, seventies, <laughs> yeah. and use your imagination on that one. <laughs> So back to what I talked about earlier, and just shoot me if I'm just making you sick with this statement. But if you want to invest in private companies, fine. Just don't do it with all your money. You know, set aside your speculative money, money that you can do without, do without forever in case it goes to zero. So just a small portion. Did you hear me? Okay. So I am Barbara Friedberg. You can find me on my website at Barbara Friedberg Personal Finance. I also have a YouTube channel called Barbara Friedberg. I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming on, Barb. That's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us on Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, Wealth Manager of Innovative Advisor Group. We don't just manage your wealth, we make your life better. You can find more about me at InnovativeWealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on this show. You can also check out our show at Money Tree Investing Podcast. On our website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Please remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel for immediate access to the new shows when they're released. When you subscribe to the show, it allows us to get access to some of the top minds of investing in personal finance. While you're here, please leave a comment and question if you want us to address it on the show. Have a great week ahead. And remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life.